start our second session of today, uh, today conference, and that's my great pleasure to introduce your next uh, guest speaker of the conference, who is Professor Michael Maidan. He's a distinguished professor of uh, Pennsylvania State University, and his major field of study is Ukrainian studies, uh, but also Ukrainian literature and language and Russian literature and language. Uh, he is uh, an author of uh, more than 30 translations from uh, Ukrainian and Russian into English. Uh, his recent books, his, his recent book uh, is uh, her, st her stories. Her stories. With the stress of her uh, of uh, um, female prose writing uh, of Ukrainian writers. Uh, so female writers, if you want to, to look at, so please do so after the um, speech. Um, and uh, but also uh, he, uh, Professor Michael Naidan, has a strong connection uh, to media sphere. He was uh, an editor in chief of Slavic and East European Journal in 1993-1999, and he's currently a deputy editor of the Ukrainian Quarterly. Uh, and uh, he will be uh, speaking about um, Ukrainian identity through uh, American media. Uh, after uh, Michael Maidan's speech, uh, we will switch to the uh, answer uh, questions and answer session, and you uh, you may ask your questions uh, either in Ukrainian uh, or in Russian, but also in English, because Michael Maidan is fluent in Ukrainian and in Russian too. Okay, uh, your, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Вибачте, uh, що я, я не читаю по, по кріжки, через те, що я звик так писати, на швидку руку по-англійськи, і я написав по-англійськи. Uh, so the title of my talk is American Media Perceptions of Ukraine. I don't consider myself a specialist in media studies, but I study the media. And uh, obviously with the events of the last year or so, uh, I've been following the media very closely. And I actually... Uh, uh, habit that was inculcated in me uh, early on, uh, I, every morning when I wake up and have my uh, latte, I make my latte, uh, I s sit there in front of the computer screen and I read news from all over the world for about an hour and a half, two hours, Russian sites, American sites, Ukrainian sites, you know, just to see what's happening and see different perspectives. So in that sense, I do follow the media quite closely. Now I also do write some things for the media. So, now, uh, I was born in 1952 and uh, uh, grew up in the United States uh, in a Ukrainian family. My parents immigrated to the U.S. from displaced persons camp in Germany in 1949. Now, over that time, I've seen very dramatic changes in American perceptions of Ukraine and Ukrainians from my childhood in the 1960s to the present day. Now, certain historical realities have shaped that perception since Ukraine was submerged in the USSR until 1991, average Americans during the Soviet period generally perceived everyone from that region as Russian, regardless of their actual ethnicity. So I, along with other children of the second wave of Ukrainian immigration, was forced to grow up constantly explaining the difference between uh, being a Ukrainian and, and being Russian. Uh, even, and uh, my parents were, uh, big Ukrainian patriots, though I grew up in that you know, very pro-Ukrainian spirit. Uh, even one of my one of my nicknames, I was captain of the soccer team, and, and my nickname was Kiev Flash. <laughs> so, because in the old days, believe it or not, I used to run pretty quickly. Uh, not so much anymore, although I do play squash and tennis still these days. But um, so that during the U USSR, this term Soviet. Uh, existed there in the Sovietsky Chilovic and you know, whatever uh, that seems to mean. Uh, but that's of course not an ethnicity uh, Soviet. Uh, so uh, because it's not an ethnicity, expediency kind of led to this homogenization of uh, you know, this misconception of Ukrainian identity as being Russian by many Americans. Soviet for them meant Russian. Uh, the subservient position of ethnic Ukrainians within the USSR comprised the typical dynamic between colonizers and the colonized, the latter of whom, in the Ukrainian case, were assimilated into the dominant Russian culture or on the periphery of it or marginalized by it. So this general perception of Ukraine and Ukrainians, too, was reflected in the press during the Cold War period when, a result, as a result of the Berlin airlift, Sputnik, the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
the arms race, and other events, the Soviet Union was treated overwhelmingly in the American print, television, and radio uh, press as the arch enemy of the United States. And by analogy, Ukrainians, since they were part of the USSR, were somehow associated with that amorphous, threatening, generic Soviet mass. After the end of the Khrushchev thaw, and with the beginning of the reactionary suppression of Ukrainian writers and cultural activists in the late 1960s through the mid-1980s, there was somewhat of an increase in press coverage of things Ukrainian, with an amplified emphasis on the quote-unquote nationalities problem of the USSR which itself consisted of more than 200 different ethnic groups, with Ukrainians second in number behind Russians. Uh, there was a famous, uh, I don't know if it's an actual quote from Khrushchev uh, when he said, uh, talked about the Ukrainian problem when he said, the big problem is there are too many of them. I can't kill all of them. Uh, and uh, that's attributed to Khrushchev. So that just the fact that there were so many Ukrainians uh, was a uh, really important uh, you know, second in number in the USSR. So uh, with that uh, ethnic diversity one of the, of the USSR, there was a reaction, a scholarly reaction to that, uh, in that uh, a journal was created. Uh, originally at City, uh, I think it was City College of New York, uh, uh, the fellow's first name was Henry, and I can't remember his last name, but he created a journal uh, called uh, Nationalities Papers a journal of nationalism and ethnicity. It was founded in 1972. And in the late 1990s, it began to organize a yearly conference in New York City at Columbia University, uh, known as the Association for the Studies of Nationalities Conference, or by its initials, ASN. That conference has grown uh, to be an extremely large scholarly gathering that meets every April with a rather large worldwide group of scholars and cultural activists. And there always is a very large uh, number number of Ukraine, uh, in, uh, people interested in Ukrainian studies at that conference. I've gone to that four or five times myself. Now, over the past decade or so, uh, it has been run by the political scientist uh, Dominique Raphael, uh, who's the chair of Ukrainian studies at the University of Ottawa. And uh, uh, I think that's a really cool thing, and it's a very good thing to have uh, people who aren't ethnically Ukrainian in chairs of Ukrainian studies. So he obviously is a, a a French Canadian background and uh, is the chair of uh, Ukrainian studies, a political scientist at the University of Ottawa. Now, uh, the Ukrainian diaspora in England, the US, and Canada did much to support the plight of imprisoned Ukrainian writers and intellectuals by protesting at the UN, in the US Capitol, and elsewhere. Uh, my parents took me to many of these protests. We would drive four hours to Washington, DC, uh, you know, to protest in, either in front of the uh, Soviet embassy or uh, by the White House, uh, and the diaspora was very active uh, in publishing the writings of many of the dissidents in English translations, but unfortunately usually in very small print runs uh, with small presses. Uh, the events organized by the Ukrainian diaspora were on occasion covered by local television, radio media, and local newspapers, but the impact was always quite limited. Ethnic Ukrainians were seen as pushing the, these issues, pushing their own agenda. Uh, with little support from American society in general, uh, except for some in the diaspora and some of the other uh, nationalities uh, who were uh, oppressed. Uh, for example, the Baltic states. Uh, people from the Baltic states tended to be very supportive of the Ukrainians and vice versa in the diaspora. Also Poles, uh, of course, and others who suffered under Soviet domination. Now, Ukraine and Ukrainians were much the same as Ralph Ellison described black people in America in his novel, Invisible Man. The Ukrainians were mostly invisible to the world uh, at that time. And those were times when ethnicity and, and your origins were not really uh, explored very much. Everyone had to become Americanized, uh, to go, you know, go into the melting pot and become an American, whatever that means. Uh, and actually times of change considerably when there's a big focus on your own ethnic origins and finding yourself uh, you know, in terms of your ethnicity. Now, American media radically changed from 1986 on in terms of its perception of Ukraine for a number of reasons. Uh, from my perspective, media reaction both in general and specifically regarding Ukraine is largely event and personality driven. 
The great tragic events that focused the tension of the world was the Chernobyl disaster on April 26, 1986. The lack of transparency and slow response of the Soviet political hierarchy to the disaster convinced both Soviet citizens and the world that the Soviet political elite were not serving the interests of the people. One need only to recall that the Soviet government refused to cancel the May Day parade in Kiev uh, five days after the Chernobyl disaster, uh, despite the fact that they knew the dangers of the ra uh, radiation, particularly the young children. Coverage went viral in the, in the television and the print media in the United States after the event, which began as a mystery since no one initially outside of the Kremlin knew the source of the radiation. Much of the world learned the location of Ukraine just because of the catastrophe happened, the, the, the catastrophe happened on Ukrainian soil. Now the foreign criticism of uh, Soviets and the groundswell of resentment of the people in the USSR forced the government to change its policies with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev uh, after the disaster implementing his policies of glasnost and uh, perestroika, the lessening of controls over Soviet society and a new openness. This led to a cultural renaissance in Ukraine, in particular, as well in the other constituent republics of the USSR, USSR and the Eastern Bloc. Following increasing civil unrest in Moscow and attempted coups, the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991. Ukraine became independent for virtually the first time in modern history, theoretically allowing the new nation with an ancient history to establish its own image in the world. Now, coverage was continual in the national use during the events of the dissolution of the USSR and the immediate aftermath, but quieted down over time. Now, the issue of Ukrainian nuclear weapons became an idée fixe. Uh, for the American and Western press until it was resolved, there was great fear that Ukraine's, Ukraine would keep its nuclear weapons and would become a nuclear power and would be a threat to uh, Europe and the, the rest of the world. Uh, once that was resolved, then the issue was taken off the table and little attention was uh, paid to that again. Uh, one curious thing that we saw after that uh, Ukrainian independence in terms of uh, American television and American films Ukrainians started to become actors, uh, personalities in these films, but they were always presented as the bad guys, as the, the crazed fanatics who were s stealing a nuclear weapon. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a more recent film, and uh, you know, the actor Vito Morgensen uh, plays it, uh, in it, and he plays a, a crazy uh, Ukrainian gangster, and there's a funny scene in it. I can't repeat the one word because it's a very bad word, but uh, uh, these uh, very tough uh, African American guys come in, and uh, they want uh, they want to convince him to uh, you know give him money, and he takes out a big knife and he takes the knife and he slams it on the the desk in front of him, and he and he says to them, "Don't f with the Ukrainian," and you know that's the uh, you know the essence of it. now. While this is you know it's kind of humorous, it's it's a really good thing in one respect because it actually shows Ukrainians as being visible. Even though they're presented as bad guys, they're visible. Uh, so that's the first stage towards uh, rec recognition. Uh, now, one particular technological advance radically began to change the public media landscape in the 1990s, the rise of the internet and the World Wide Web, uh, which led to an exponential increase in access to news and events allowing people from around the world to follow events, often nearly in real time. With You had cameras, you had cameras on the Maidan, uh, the first Maidan and the second Maidan. I found myself glued, uh, watching what was going on, uh, listening to performances. I'm sure a lot of you also did at that time. And so the next event in Ukraine that captured the American imagination happened during the age of the internet, the Orange Revolution in uh, 2004, which received daily coverage in all the American uh, major TV broadcast networks, uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, by national public TV, PBS, and national public radio, uh, as well as by prominent cable news, west, news networks, especially CNN, uh, which was founded in the mid-1990s, and Fox News, which was established in 1996. Uh, now, coverage was uniformly very positive in favor of the protesters and democratic ideals. Ukrainians were portrayed aptly as willing to lay down their lives for their freedom in the gatherings on the Maidan. The live TV coverage of events uh, 
there, there happened to be, it was fairly continuous with many network reporters on site, uh, particularly from cable news channels, uh, and also in the prominent print press, particularly the New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times, and also on the internet. It's a given, though, that American media is uh, somewhat fickle, following and driving stories only as long they, as long as they hold the viewer's attention uh, and the reader's interest and maintain high ratings. So once the drama of an issue is resolved, or uh, the focus on the event becomes resolved and things die down, uh, or another story supplants it, the media coverage largely then disappears with little or just occasional follow-up. And that's what happened after the Orange Revolution. We figured out, oh, uh, they stopped it, everything is good, everything's perfect, and all of a sudden there was a media shifted to some other, uh, some other topic that happened to pop up at the time. Uh, uh, and uh, also, the media in general loves these dramatic moments, these uh, history-changing moments, and follows very closely when those things are happening. But uh, they're always looking for a, a new one to supplant that that will, that will uh, gather the uh, interest of the public. Now, besides traditional media and its outlets on the internet, one additional internet invention in particular would play a significant role in American perceptions of the Euromaidan, the invasion uh, of Crimea, and the Russian-backed war in eastern Ukraine, and that's YouTube. And I should uh, point out one other thing is, uh, that was very important, and this is this thing, this little thing that all of you have, uh, that all have cameras in them, uh, with people taking pictures. Uh, I'm sure all of you remember uh, when uh, the one Ukrainian protester was arrested and stripped naked in the cold. There were pictures of him immediately appearing uh, on YouTube, films of that happening, and uh, with immediate immediacy of uh, reaction to that. And, uh, People could see that uh, how these uh, protesters were being treated, and uh, that had a very positive effect on perception of the Ukrainians uh, in in those protests. Now, that uh, hosting site YouTube was founded by three young college students as a means for exchanging large video files uh, in early 2005. But it's become significant, significantly more than that, and a very powerful media outlet in its own right. It also has the advantage of offering unfiltered immediacy and worldwide distribution. Besides providing entertainment videos, YouTube has turned into a vast media source for promote, promotion of all kind, kinds of causes, uh, including using it as a propaganda tool for reactionary forces. When pro-Euromaidan or just pro-truth media were threatened or suppressed during the Euromaidan, videos began popping up constantly on YouTube reaching millions of people around the world as soon as they could be uploaded. And there's a very famous, I don't know if you all are aware of it, but there was a very famous I Am Ukrainian video by uh, Yulia Maroshevska, which was filmed in the Maidan in Kiev by Grant Mitchell and published on YouTube on February 10, 2015, or 14. It reached millions of American and English language viewers worldwide. It was an impassioned, articulate plea in English by a young Ukrainian woman who seemed to become the living human face of the Euromaidan in the mind of the average American. And if you could show that, to, I'll just put that on for you if you haven't seen it. It'll, for those of you who have, it'll just remind you of it.
Soviet Union. We want our arts not to be corrupted. We want to be free. I know that maybe tomorrow we will have no phone, no internet connection, and we will be alone here. And maybe this man will murder us one after another when it will be dark here. And now I ask you to build this freedom in our country. You can help us only by telling this story to your friends, only by sharing this video. Please share, share it. Speak to your friends, speak to your family, speak to your government and show that you support us. So uh, with that uh, you know, appearance by her, uh, the American audience was able to bond very deeply with her emotional plea and feel great empathy for the Ukrainian people and their cause. In fact, the video greatly humanized and personalized the events that were happening on the Maidan. And it was in some ways, in many ways, more powerful and effective than just the live filming of just the, the crowds on the Maidan being attacked by the Berkut on a, on a daily basis. Those are kind of like mass events that are happening. And this was just focused on one individual and also that emotionality of it. Uh, whenever you can touch emotional heartstrings, it's a much more powerful uh, image that you can present. Uh, she also became kind of a rock star. She appeared on a lot of American uh, TV channels and interviews. Uh, she appeared on CN, CNN several times uh, and uh, lot, lots of all kinds of interviews. She also took a tour of the diaspora, you know, just because of that uh, one little video. Now, American networks and their nightly news broadcasts and cable news outlets cover the events on the Euromaidan as the lead story for several weeks until its resolution on February 22, 2014. The drama of events drove the coverage, which was overwhelmingly in favor of demonstrators against the corrupt Yanukovych government. The American press presented the events on the Euromaidan as a classic battle of good versus evil, of democracy and freedom versus authoritarianism. During the events on the Euromaidan and in the aftermath of Putin's annexation of Crimea, I personally was contacted uh, by two New York Times op-ed page editors who wanted Ukrainian intellectuals to describe their reactions to events. Uh, so I got them into contact with Yuri Andrikovich, Mikola Ryabchuk, Oksana Zabushko, Andrei Kurkov, Tanya Malyarchuk, and a few others. Uh, Andrikovich's op-ed uh, piece appeared on January 29th, 2014, under the title, Love and Hatred in Kiev, uh, while Zabushko uh, deferred and decided not to write an op-ed piece herself, she did uh, provide one by a colleague from Simferopol in Crimea, Professor Olga Dukic, uh, who published her piece on the Crimean invasion of the Times. Uh, the editors contacted me about that. Uh, they sent me the original version of it. I edited it for them. It wasn't very well written in English, and I uh, kind of transpose what the actual meaning was behind the, uh, you, you can kind of think uh, in Ukrainian or Russian and, uh, and understand what she was trying to say. So uh, I did that for them and then they ended up uh, doing another rewrite for it before it appeared. And also, uh, and her, her piece uh, was titled, Is Russia Nostalgic for Afghanistan? And the Times also published Nikola Ryabchuk's op-ed piece uh, March 5th, 2014, under the, the title, Ukraine Not Ready for Divorce. Now, the Times decided not to publish my own op-ed piece, which I entitled Putin or Rasputin, uh, because I assume my opinions regarding Putin were quite harsh, as they still continue to be, uh, because I, I view things as kind of personality-driven, uh, which if he would back off, things would uh, resolve themselves. Now, uh, I also, I tried to get that op-ed piece published in about, I don't know if you know the way op-ed pieces work. You write the op-ed piece and you send it to uh, the journal's op-ed editor and then it take two or three days and then they get back to you with, uh, if they're going to publish it or not. So it's, uh, it's a complex process. They did uh, publish uh, many other Ukrainian op-ed pieces, uh, uh, several of my colleagues. Uh, we have a group, uh, American Association of Ukrainian Studies. They created a website of, uh, people with expertise uh, 
who can be interviewed, and a lot of those were contacted and uh, produce op-ed pieces. Uh, they didn't uh, translate, uh, they didn't publish uh, Tanya Margarchuk's op-ed piece, which I translated, and which uh, was entitled The Crime Ia Story. So crime with an A after it. So the, the crime story, the Crimea story. Uh, I did publish two pieces for the online version of the literary journal, World Literature Today, who contacted me. Uh, one was published uh, as a blog piece on December 11, 2013, under the title Protesting on the Square in Kiev, Some Literary Insights. And the other appeared on January 27, 2014, under the title Hope is the Meaning of the Maidan for Ukraine and the World. While the Times has shown mostly excellent coverage of the Ukrainian situation since the Euromaidan, they do by design try to balance their coverage with opinions from the other side. They published a piece then by pro-Putin political scientist Stephen Cohen, who entirely presents the Kremlin's point of view on events. Uh, his talking points are virtually indistinguishable from the Putinist party line in saying uh, several things. The West threatened Putin and Russia by expanding the NATO alliance. Russia has an historical right to Crimea. The West humiliated Russia after the collapse of the USSR. Crimea and Eastern Ukraine overwhelmingly desire to be part of Russia. U.S. interests were behind the Euromaidan, etc. Actually, if you follow four or five main people, they all follow the uh, Lavrov Kremlin party line and saying all those things, so including Steve Cohen and, and including the several other people who do that. But uh, the vast majority of the coverage is very pro-Ukrainian democracy. Now, uh, Stephen Cohen, whom I met only once personally, uh, has had a lengthy history of supporting the USSR. Particularly, there was a whole series of acrimonious debates that became, became quite personal with the archly anti-Soviet Harvard history uh, professor Richard Pipes during the Cold War on national public television. Uh, and uh, I actually also know uh, Stephen Cohen's wife, uh, Katrina Vandenhuvel, who comes from a very wealthy family, and she's the editor of a journal uh, called The Nation, which is a leftist uh, journal in, uh, in New out of New York City. Uh, there also is a political scientist from Rhode Island University, Nikolai Petro, who wrote scurrilous attacks on the press and internet media against Ukraine while he was a Fulbright scholar uh, here in Ukraine in Odessa. And he's a, consistently been in the pro-Putin camp, though in his scholarly writings, he's not quite as radical as he is when he uh, writes articles for the press. Uh, but by and large, uh, coverage has been really good, very uh, positive in terms of uh, in the coverage of Ukraine. And I mentioned before that a lot of coverage is event-driven and a lot of coverage is also personality-driven. I'm just going to go over the names of a few people who, uh, for the most part, have presented a very uh, you know, pro-Ukrainian democracy uh, point of view uh, over this time. But one of the best, of course, is uh, Professor Timothy Snyder, who's a Yale University Harvard professor. Uh, who publishes in all the big outlets, including the New York Review of Books, and uh, very famous for his book, The Bloodlands. I heard he was here in uh, Lviv last year, uh, and uh, gave a talk that was, uh, had uh, a lot of people packed in uh, to hear him. Uh, uh, one of the, the very good uh, articulate uh, uh, speakers is Gary G uh, Kaspado, uh, the former chess champion who's been a very outspoken critic of the Putin regime. Uh, they also had a, a big event at the University of Toronto. You can look this up uh, online if you'd like to see it. It was a, a four-person debate, and it included uh, Gary Kasparov and uh, uh, three other people, including Stephen Cohen, uh, and they filmed that. Uh, and you can you see that at uh, it's the University of Toronto site. And I'm sure it's at uh, Kaspadov. There's a link at Kaspadov's uh, own website. Uh, one of the other people who's really in the know about a, a lot of the things happening is Ann Applebaum, who writes a bi-weekly foreign affairs column for the Washington Post. And she's also the director of the Transitions Forum at the Legatum uh, Institute in London. Uh, actually, she studied Russian with me when I taught at Yale University uh, and did pretty well in the class, I, although I don't remember her very well. Uh, so. But uh, she was a very quiet uh, student. So, uh, and uh, uh, Anne Applebaum is somewhat of a pragmatist, uh, realist in looking at events. Uh, she's married to uh, uh, 
a Polish uh, gentleman, and uh, so she does look at uh, things from that Eastern European perspective. Uh, but she also is a pragmatist in, uh, in one of her recent articles. She talked about she doesn't think Crimea uh, uh, resolution uh, is possible for Crimea be being returned to Ukraine, but some other uh, resolution has to be found uh, for that. But by and large, he's uh, very much in the know and very much promotes the Ukrainian perspective on things. Uh, one of the, the big TV personalities who pops up quite often is uh, Christian Freeland, uh, who's a Canadian-Ukrainian writer, journalist, and uh, politician. She's an MP uh, in Canada, you now a member of Canadian Parliament, and she's a re regular contributor to CNN. She often comes on a show, uh, there's, a, there's a show called Farid Zakaria's Sunday show, Farid Zakaria GPS. And uh, I know there are some shows, uh, CNN initially just put on Stephen Cohen, and he put on basically a propaganda show pro pro-Russian, pro-Putin, and uh, thousands of people, including uh, me, wrote uh, in protest to that, and then the next time that he appeared, uh, Christy Freeland, who's a very articulate spokesperson for uh, Ukraine, uh, appeared on the show as a counter to him. Uh, Cohen will not appear with anyone who uh, calls him a mouthpiece of the, uh, the Putin regime. So it's, I guess he's fearful of the truth, but uh, Christy Freeland is a very, uh, she's very persistent, but a, re a really good interlocutor who uh, uh, really knows how to defend her point of view uh, without, uh, without uh, saying nasty things about someone. Uh, a lot of people get on with Stephen Cohen, call him a liar, and uh, a lot of what he says uh, from a U Ukrainian perspective is not true, uh, but then as soon as he's called a liar, uh, with the Richard Pipes, uh, they almost appeared weekly uh, on national public TV, and they would get into big fights, they, uh, and it became very personal, uh, you know, calling each other arrogant bastards and you know, nasty names, and they eventually took them off because it got a, into very personal attacks uh, back then. And a couple of the other, I'll just point out a few of the other uh, very important names. Uh, uh, there's Adrian Karatnitsky, uh, who has also been fantastic. He appears on a lot of uh, TV shows. He's a senior fellow with the Atlanta Council's program on transatlantic relations, and he's a regular guest on TV shows uh, on CNN, CNBC, and uh, other TV programs. A very articulate spokesman, and he really is on top of uh, events. Uh, one of the uh, most important people in print media uh, and internet media is Alexander Motte, uh, who's a political science professor at uh, Rutgers University in Newark. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine. Also, he has a uh, a regular blog on worldaffairsjournal.org, uh, if you want to take a look at that sometime. Uh, and uh, I'll just go over just a couple more names here uh, of important people in media who are very, very much presenting the Ukrainian point of view. Uh, David Remnick, who's editor of the New Yorker magazine, uh, he lived in Moscow for several years, so he very much knows uh, the situation, and they do uh, publish uh, many things on the crisis. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, particularly, they did a, a really lengthy uh, interview with Michael McFaul, who's a former ambassador to Russia, and uh, who, with Hillary Clinton, was the architect of the reset button, the famous reset button uh, policy uh, that dismally failed uh, with Russia. But Mc McFaul, after, the, I guess he spent about three years as ambassador to Russia, uh, Putin sent out agents following him around, bugging him, harassing him, and he finally just gave up and uh, actually has turned 180 degrees around and has become extremely anti-Putin. He was very much into creating dialogue, let's understand them, let's understand him, and we'll work something out. And uh, so he has uh, <coughs> his per personal experience uh, with Russian reality you know, changed his perspective. Now, I'll just give a few preliminary conclusions. Uh, now, Ukrainian identity is created in the ang Anglophone world in multiple ways. You know, there's multiple media. And uh, there is a need to overcome past stereotypes uh, in the Anglophone world, also in the Russian world, also in the minds of others. Uh, some of the biggest stereotypes uh, of Ukrainians are from Russians. All Russian uh, Ukrainians don't know how to govern themselves. Uh, you know, only Russians are able to do that. And uh, Ukrainians are a bunch of uh, smiling, happy peasants, you know, who go around singing songs and eating salo, 
and you know, they don't have you know, intellectuals, they don't have writers like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Uh, I, I once wrote an article, uh, 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 when you uh, Google Gogol, you never get uh, which I in which I point out the fact that uh, Russian uh, culture has appropriated uh, Hohol. Hohol was originally, when the, the first reviews of his Ukrainian works came out, that were written in Russian, they called him an Ukrainsky pisati, Kotori pisat paruski. And uh, they saw that as something very exotic. But as soon as Gogol gained a certain amount of fame, he suddenly became a Ruski pisati. And uh, virtually in all Russian sources today, you will see him presented as a Ruski pisati. Now, part of the problem is Ruski means nationality, and Ruski in the sense of the rights in Russian. Uh, so that, you know that's uh, somewhat of a problem. But uh, the Russian attitude towards a writer like Nabokov, uh, they call Nabokov a uh, Rusko, uh, uh, Anglisko Ruski pisati everywhere. But they're not willing to call uh, Hohol. Ukrainsko Ruski Pisatio, or Ukrainsky Pisatio, Kotori Pisal, Paruski. But uh, so that's uh, another way that the empire appropriates uh, everything. Now, uh, on a macro level, there are individuals who re represent Ukrainian culture in the West uh, and, and uh, in, a, in a very positive way. And there are sports figures, you know, such as the skater of Sana Bayul. Uh, there's the soccer player Andriy Shevchenko, uh, and uh, the, the Klitschko brothers, and, and others in the sports world that you know, sh you know, show, even though the Klitschko brothers are Russian-speaking, they're very much Ukrainian uh, citizens, and they promote uh, you know, the, their Ukrainian uh, origins. And uh, you also have uh, persons in the entertainment industry, like Ruslana, like uh, Daka Bracha. Daka Bracha, I just saw them in the neighboring town at Bucknell University, to where my university is, and they did a performance there to, to about three or 400 people. And uh, all of these uh, people in the audience, many of them, most of them, who didn't speak or understand Ukrainian, just loved this. They just loved this. This was real exotic and great and wild and crazy for them, and they really enjoyed it. And also the guy who sings, I don't remember his name, but uh, he, also promoted the Ukrainian cause. He, he came out uh, and at the end of his con concert he said, stop Putin. And, uh, and so he got that political point across, but in a very nice way, in a cultural way, he presented certain aspects of the uh, Ukrainian culture, but also promoted, uh, you know, uh, promoted the cause of democracy. And there are also many uh, Ukrainian intellectuals, and they happen to be uh, polygots. Uh, they know several languages. Uh, like Yuri Andrukovich, uh, Oksana Zabushko, Nikola Remchuk, and many others who speak these different languages of, of Europe, uh, English, Polish, German, uh, Russian, and who are very articulate spokesmen, spokespersons, and, and articulate voices for uh, the Ukrainian nation. On a micro level, uh, one thing that's very important is all of you and individuals and young people and uh, who uh, have contact with people from other countries who you know, speak some of those other languages, who create very positive images, of, you know, winning over the minds of people uh, one by one to show them that Ukrainians are cool people and nice people and uh, and uh, you know have all these positive attributes. And this happens in many ways through study abroad programs for people visiting uh, here uh, in Ukraine and. Uh, as a matter of fact, the one anthology that uh, I co-edited, uh, it's called From Three Worlds, which was one of the first uh, anthologies of contemporary Ukrainian writing, actually happened because a writer by the name of Ed Hogan, uh, who was the owner of Zephyr Press, which was a small press in Boston, uh, at the advice of his friend Asko Menechuk, uh, who is a very famous editor and uh, writer of Ukrainian origin who writes in English, uh, extremely well-read and a uh, novelist. Uh, Ed, uh, uh, Oscar Mendechuk suggested to Ed that uh, he visit Kiev uh, because he said it's a really great city and my friend Oksana Zabushko is there. So Ed uh, changed his flight to come home and went through Kiev, stayed a day and a half in Kiev and after that day and a half with Oksana Zabushko, she convinced him to do an anthology of uh, 
contemporary Ukrainian literature. So we collected a uh, editorial group. I remember it was uh, uh, Oksana, me, or no, it wasn't Oksana, it was uh, Solomia Pavlichko, uh, me, Askud Nenichuk, and Nikola Remchuk. And so we put together this uh, anthology that happened by, on a personal basis through contact with that one person. And, uh, you know, through that one person in, in Kiev. And it also happens through a growing diaspora. Uh, there are a lot of Ukrainians who are living and working abroad in countries and creating a positive image. So I'm almost done, so yeah. And uh, so all of this contact creates a, a you, you know, Ukrainian point of view, uh, promotes the Ukrainian you know, point of view and cause, uh, and uh, really heightens Ukraine's standing in the, in the world. Uh, and the, there also were a, a number of uh, figures such as George Clooney, uh, the actor who during the, the Revolution of Dick, uh, Dignity came out with a YouTube speech uh, that he presented. I'm assuming that uh, Clooney is very pro-Ukrainian because he's very good friends with Ukrainian actress Vera Farmiga, uh, who acted in several films with him, uh, who is Ukrainian. Actually, I knew Vera Farmiga when she was about this big uh, because she lived uh, in uh, Newark. And my uh, mother-in-law taught her Ukrainian at the Ukrainian school, the St. John the Baptist School in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And uh, also there are you know, you know, other actors uh, uh, who, who also you know, presented the Ukrainian cause. There are some who became very pro-Putin and anti-Ukrainian, and I, and I won't name them. There are just a couple of, them, uh, of those. Uh, so there are... There are also, I just wanted to point out this one thing about the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian government is wholly uh, pro-Ukrainian in terms of uh, uh, the American uh, houses, of both the Senate and, uh, and the House of Representatives. And they're very much in favor of Ukraine creating an uh, open society, uh, particularly two guys, uh, Robert Menendez, who's a senator from New Jersey, and, uh, and John McCain, uh, both of them who were almost on a daily basis uh, trying to get Obama to send defensive weapons to Ukraine. And uh, they're over Congress is overwhelmingly in support of that. Uh, President Obama is opposed to that because he doesn't want to create a trigger point and have a worse reaction. So he's fearful of a reaction from Putin. So uh, President Obama is stopping that. So uh, uh, because he basically generally is opposed to the use of mil military force. So uh, just in sum, I want to say in essence, Ukraine and Ukrainians need to uh, continue to build bridges uh, to the Anglophone world and uh, other, other world, worlds where other languages are spoken. Uh, and in that way, create uh, visibility out of what once was an invisible people and nation. Well, thank you. And if you have questions, I can answer them. In. Yes, you can take a seat here. Sure. As we have only uh, five minutes prior to the uh, dinner break, uh, we will probably grab five more minutes from that break. So we have ten minutes only. We will probably do the format that uh, we used uh, uh, during the first session. We will ask all the questions uh, and then we will uh, give Michael five minutes to answer all of them. So please prepare your questions. And my a question will be uh, the following. Uh, the first one is very little, as, as short as the article B. So if we use the Ukraine, it's for sure emphasizes the uh, post-colonial nature of Ukraine. And this is a mistake. And um, as I uh, monitor uh, on the internet, uh, pro-Putin uh, uh, authors usually uh, use this uh, phrase, the Ukraine, how to fight with that. And the second question uh, is um, the following. You define the reaction of American media toward Ukrainian uh, events as uh, uh, personality and event uh, uh, format. Uh, uh, if I may, I, um, I would even specify uh, personality and event in very narrow, specific fields, such as, for example, geopolitics, uh, including a war issue. Uh, the second one, I can count on my fingers, the second one is um, probably ecology, including Chernobyl. Uh, the third one is uh, sports, including, you mentioned Klitschko, uh, um, uh, Shevchenko as a soccer player. Uh, and probably the fourth, uh, a bit of culture. I mean, Ruslana was wild dancing, uh, probably Dacha Bracha or Okean Elze, and that's it. 
uh, how to enlarge this menu of uh, fields for American reader uh, to, to be acquainted with? So that's my second question, and we will switch to the audience. Please, just raise your hand. You may ask your questions uh, either in Russian or in Ukrainian, uh, so please do so. While you're thinking, so we'll give them the opportunity for Michael Naidon to answer my questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Ukraine, of course, as well, I guess I should do this. Okay. It is on. It's on. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, the policy of uh, many, uh, many news outlets is to use Ukraine and not the Ukraine. That's uh, extremely important. I also think it's extremely important to get Russians to it's extremely important also to get Russians to use the Ukraini and not not Ukraini when you use not Ukraini. It's uh, treating Ukraine as a religion, as a region, not as a country, and, and countries are always going to be with the the uh, in Russian. So I think that's a... And uh, we have this problem, uh, we take off points. I teach a internet course in Ukrainian culture, and if any of the students write the Ukraine, we take off points uh, at the end of the course when they turn in their final papers. But also in terms of the spellings, uh, you know, the Kiev spelling, K-I-E-V, which is uh, from Russian transliteration, the Ukrainian government uh, preferred version is K-Y-I-V from Ukrainian transliteration. So, you know, those are small issues, but uh, most Ukrainians uh, in Anglo-speaking world uh, are very much promoting the use of just Ukraine. Uh, of course, some people will point out you do have the Union of South Africa, the United States, but the United States are a collection of different states, so that's one thing and that most people call uh, South Africa, South Africa, not the Union of South Africa anymore. So Ukraine does need to, it's, it's hard to get over uh, habit. So uh, the media, particularly the print media, is used to doing things in a certain way and they continue to do it. And it's not that they uh, want to insult anybody, it's just that that's the way they've done it always and they continue to do it. So it's inertia. Well, you know, in terms of the personality-driven uh, aspects, yeah, a lot of those groups. I mean, uh, Opian Elze is extraordinarily popular in Russia and uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, more groups like that, and I think the more groups, uh, you don't necessarily have to, uh, as Daka Braka has shown, you don't necessarily have to perform things in English in order to reach a wider audience. Uh, and uh, if you do have uh, innovative, creative things like that, uh, uh, and uh, I think that's really up to Ukrainians to do that and have more of that outreach and have uh, more cultural exchanges. Uh, there are a lot of Ukrainian groups who tend to come to the United States but they tend, and Canada. They tend to come to the uh, festivals in Canada, or the Ukrainian festival uh, in the autumn in Canada, and at Soyuzivka, the Ukrainian resort in uh, the Catskill Mountains. There's a there's a big uh, summer festival there, a festival of youth, uh, and so a lot of performers, uh, so a lot of the big performers, performers from Ukraine come there. But they really haven't garnered a big audience uh, in in the U.S. Even the Dracha Bracha tour, they're playing. Although they've played in places like Kennedy Center, which is a very big, prestigious place, uh, they really play mostly in smaller venues that hold three to 500 people, not thousands of people. Uh, so it's you know it's a process that, that goes on. I do my best to promote uh, Ukrainian literature in English, Ukrainian culture in English. Uh, that's why I did that uh, anthology. Uh, I've done a lot of contemporary authors. Uh, Irene Rostovutko's novel, uh, The Button Guzik, uh, I translated. Uh, uh, Sara Bande Bande Sare, uh, I co-translated. Uh, one thing that I've done is uh, I've learned to, I've trained students, many students who come to do their master's work with me, including uh, Maria's sister, Olya Tiparenko, who with me translated uh, an extremely uh, difficult uh, novel by Maria Matios, Kadarusha, which is uh, really complex to present in English. Actually, they're using my translation now to create the subtitles of the movie that's going to be, come out, be coming out. I'm having a very difficult time publishing it uh, because it's not an easy work. Uh, I kind of lucked out in publishing uh, Perversion, my translation of uh, Yuri Androkovich's novel, uh, with Northwestern University Press, which is a very prestigious university press. 
but big publishers, uh, this was impossible to publish anywhere else but with Glagoslav publishers. Uh, first of all, most women writers writing today in Ukraine are writers of novels. They're not writers of short stories, except for Tanya Malarchuk and, and a few other shorter pieces. Uh, I did uh, translate an old uh, Oksana Zabushko story called Ina Planetyanka uh, for this uh, volume. But I, had I translated that 25 years ago, had no success in placing it anywhere to publish. So it's been very easy to publish a lot of things in journals, particularly poetry, small pieces, small short stories. There's a lot of interest. I was contacted in 2010 uh, by uh, International Poetry <coughs> Review to do a special issue of Ukrainian poetry. So I put together a volume of the last 25 years of Ukrainian poetry. And uh, that took the entire volume. And the editors told me that was probably the best issue that they had ever published uh, in the journal. He said it was the best received issue. So it's step by step, more people translating, uh, you know, getting uh, more people involved. Uh, I just was approached by a, a young American uh, woman who was here on a Fulbright scholarship and she wants to translate Ukrainian poetry and so of course I'll be helping her out as much as I can to help publish things and, and promote them. I'm uh, very much into developing the young talents and you know, uh, promoting uh, other people to do things. Uh, I, can't, I can't do everything and I learned by Working with other people, uh, particularly with native speakers of Ukraine, it's a really good combination of having a native Ukrainian speaker and a native English speaker, although I technically am not, because I didn't speak any uh, English until I was six years old. But, uh, but then I kind of lost it. Uh, I, I like, understood my parents uh, when I started going to an American school, and, but I would talk back to them in English for a while until I, like, when I turned about 16, 17, I started rediscovering my Ukrainian roots, and I actually started taking Russian, which reintroduced me back into Ukraine. So, we see you do your best to, to promote Ukrainian literature among American uh, audience. Uh, let us check whether uh, there are, yes, there is a question from the audience. Probably one or uh, another one, yes, and we'll done. Дякую, Олегомир Федор, Львівська політехніка. Дякую, пане професоре, за цікаву інформацію і за вашу солідарність з нами. І спробую вам запропонувати дуже просте, але і непросте, водночас вже якесь парадоксальне навіть запитання. Скажіть, будь ласка, чому американці підтримують українців? Це що? Це співчуття, це солідарність, це ж... Жалість, це е, оце змагальництво чи боротьба проти Росії, це прагматичні міркування, це геополітика, це чи, чи це щось ще? Дякую. Я би сказав і, 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 і. Бо кожна людина за, за свої причини там підтримує. Але всі американці в курсі також. Це, це інша справа також. Але це дуже, наприклад, на телебаченні в нас. Там uh, Fox News, вони мають багато таких uh, генералів, колишніх американських генералів, і вони всі виступають проти Путіна, проти агресії Росії. Але скільки людей дивиться? Може 6-7 мільйонів дивиться, а в Америці 300, 300 мільйонів. Американці не хочуть висилати військо. Американське військо. Але підтримувати так зброю, як українці будуть боротися за свою свободу, американці дуже підтримують ту ідею. Ту ідею свободи. Бо Америка базована на свободі. На свободі слова, на свободі людських прав. Так, і останнє запитання за Uh, very interesting uh, story. I'm uh, very grateful for your presentation. Svetlana uh, Bobenko, Kiev National University. Um, uh, my question is, uh, do you have in American media uh, some image of uh, Ukrainian success story? How can this crisis will be resolved in a way of success story? Maybe several scenarios or some uh, one which is uh, that scenario because it's quite uh, difficult to see what is the final um, 
uh, result, uh, and uh, maybe you have some. Uh, it it can be seen differently from Ukraine, from Russia, from um, uh, the United States, uh, and from Europe. Uh, what is uh, maybe spread uh, success story and image of success story? And one one more short uh, question: Why this story about crime in uh, Crimea uh, as a crime uh, here was not published? Well. If, uh, the way editorial boards work, I'll answer the second question first, the way editorial boards work is they get together and meet and they vote on it and they decide what they're going to publish and what they're not going to publish. So it's a very random process, you just never know. And, uh, but it's a kind of a censorship. Well, it's not. It's, it's democracy at the micro level within uh, the papers, but all, all of the major newspapers, the, you know, the Chicago uh, newspapers, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Washington Post, they're all very much pro-Ukrainian. They all have you know, pro-Ukrainian stories. They also do present point of view from the other side, but in a very fair kind of way. Uh, the problem is that all of, everything happening in Ukraine is no longer in the news, except in print media mostly. <laughs> Once in a while, you have, you'll have a story. I mean, it was a big story when the airliner was shot down. That occupied the news 24 hours a day for about a week or two weeks uh, after that. So it was a very important story. But what happens is there, it's, there's another drama that has to be found to generate interest. So, 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 and what happened, Ukrainian uh, story after uh, the, uh, the Euromaidan, you know, after the Yanukovych government was deposed, all of a sudden you had the murder of, uh, well, a killing, you shouldn't call it murder but the killing of the African-American in Missouri, uh, outside of St. Louis. That racism, that became the big story everywhere, and that's what everything focused on. So, it's, it, again, it's, it's driven by uh, this notion of, you know, so this notion of drama, they want drama. I, one thing I have noticed since I read in Russian and Ukrainian, I've noticed that there's a lag time of about three days, so I read stories in Ukrainian and Russian, and then three days later, you get the story on TV. And uh, what happens is, I know uh, in Fox News, for example, they had a, there was something happened in, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, uh, after the bites of it, but you know, something happened, and what they tend to do is really take it out of proportion and make it sound something really extraordinary happened when I know in retrospect that it wasn't really a big event, it was a fairly small event and innocuous, not, not particularly important, but they create this big uh, scandalous notion of, oh, this is important, Russia is about to invade, blah, blah, blah. And, and again, it's in order to create an audience. They want, they want a bigger audience. Uh, do they, Americans, think about an end game for Ukraine? I don't think so. Uh, they, they want Ukrainians to be free. They like the fact that Ukrainians are pro-Europe uh, or pro-American. Uh, there is a big problem that Russia has in terms of its uh, relationship with the world. Russians are being booed uh, when they you know, perform soccer teams, they're being booed. Performances in Europe uh, and America, they're being booed. Uh, and Russians are being perceived as aggressors and fascists. Before, Russia could hide behind the Soviet Union. You could say it's a uh, system at this table. Now they can't. So if 80% of Russians truly support Putin, which I actually don't believe, if you, uh, there are many Russians who are you know, uh, pro-Ukrainian. Uh, one poet that I translate, uh, Olga Sedakova, wrote a letter, uh, an apology to the Ukrainian friends for the invasion, uh, very courageous people uh, in Russia, and Professor uh, Andrei Zubov, and, and many others. So I, I, I do think that there are a lot more people, in, even in Russia, uh, who don't want you know, this war to go on. And the more body bags that come back to Russia, uh, more Russian soldiers have died in the Ukrainian war than died in the entire Afghan war. Uh, and that's really amazing, that's a, that was a 10 year war. And uh, so more Russians have died in this conflict. And so it's, uh, 
I think we will stop Good. now. People yes. are hungry. And uh, dinner is ready and we run up out of time. If you have questions, you may uh, sure. just approach uh, Professor Naidan during the break. And, uh, please enjoy your dinner. Thank you.